So, hello and welcome to my conversation with Sue Uniman and Catherine Jacob. They're here today as two of the authors of a wonderful new book published by Bloomsbury just a few months ago. It's entitled Belonging. I've got a, a copy of it here. Uh, the key to transforming and maintaining diversity, inclusion and equality at work. I do want to acknowledge there is a third author, um, Mark Edwards, who couldn't make it this morning, but we're very fortunate uh, to have Sue and Catherine here. Now, this session is one of a number of conversations during Impact 2021 on the subject of diversity and inclusion. And it's of relevance to anyone who shares our ambition to have a research industry which is more representative of the world in which we live. In case you don't know, I'm Jan Gooding. I'm the president of the MRS and also a passionate advocate for more inclusive cultures. So let me introduce you to my guests properly. First of all, Catherine Jacob, OBE, I think you can see her there uh, with her, her name, is the CEO of Pearl and Dean, the cinema advertising company. And in fact, I've always enjoyed the fact that her Twitter handle is at cinema lover, and it sums up the passion she has for media and life in general. She's on a number of boards or in an advisory position in firms ranging from the Advertising Association to RADA. And I also know her as a formidable previous president of WACL and long-standing feminist and campaigner for gender equality. Sue Uniman is the Chief Transformation Officer at Mediacom, having steadily risen through the ranks as a planner and strategist. In the rapidly changing world of media, Sue's role causes her to think constantly about change and building an effective workplace culture. Now, in fact, she and Catherine have already written a book together that I'm sure many of you will have read called The Glass Wall, which has in itself been a bestseller. So I wonder if I could start, Sue, with you by asking why you felt the need to write another book, a second book, and whether the, the title Belonging kind of came to you before or, or after and what your thinking was behind choosing that name. Hi, everybody. Thanks for the lovely introduction, Jan. Yeah. Why write another book? So as you said, The Glass Wall, Success Strategies for Women at Work and Businesses that Need Business was a bestseller. And Catherine and I were on book tour, gave over 150 talks um, to lots of different organisations. We're now on book tour for Belong. And the reason that we thought we needed to write another book was that a question frequently came up at the end of the Q&A that we mm. would give. And somebody in the audience, a woman in the audience, would put her hand up and say, I've got a question now. It's not actually for Sue and Catherine. It's actually for the organisers of the talk. Mm. Where are all the men? Mm. And everybody would look around and there'd be maybe one or two men there out of out of 60 or 70 people. And uh, the organisers would say, well, it's a women's network. And, and if a man was there, he might go, well, we weren't sure it was for us. And then the woman would say, who'd ask the question, well, if we're only talking to each other, how is anything ever going to change? Mm. And our thinking suddenly shifted to thinking about Diversity and inclusion and, and, and belonging is not just about gender, it's about, as you know, all forms of diversity and inclusion and all kinds of underrepresented groups. Mm. And asking ourselves, what's the, what, what's the issue here? And over $8 billion is spent every year on diversity and inclusion efforts. It's something that a lot of people talk about, but the outcomes are disappointingly slow. So there is a handful less than a handful of women CEOs on the FTSE 100. The Fortune 500 companies and the FTSE boards overall, there's a representation of non-executive directors as women, but there are very few executive women directors, very few women in the pipeline, very few black, Asian, minority, ethnic people on those boards or in the pipeline or running those companies. And so we're still in a situation where diverse talent is not coming through. Mm. And that's not right. So we thought about what the issue was mm. and we talked to lots of people 
And we believe that the diversity and inclusion industry has this problem, which is that it has managed to exclude from the conversation and from activity and action, the very men who are still largely holding those seats of power, mm. as in very often straight white middle-aged men. Mm. That cannot be right. And it can't be right in terms of fixing things and getting things to change. Mm. So that's part one of the question is why did we feel as though we needed to write another book? We needed to write another book addressing this issue mm. and perhaps even sometimes controversially saying there needs to be room for all voices in this discussion and, and this debate. Belonging came about, it was uh, actually inspired by um, uh, the head of diversity and inclusion at um, Adidas, who was before this was at the Telegraph. Um, and he said, diversity and inclusion is one thing. You know, you can recruit for diversity, you can have policies for inclusion, but it's only when everybody feels like they belong mm. that people can genuinely contribute. And I, I've been very lucky, as you said, I've, I've been at uh, Mediacom for a very long time. And the reason that I've stayed there is because I've had a really strong sense of belonging and a really strong sense that I can contribute to the culture and help create the culture. And I think this is one of the secrets of making diversity and inclusion work mm. is that you have to have a culture where everybody feels that they belong. Mm. That, that's fascinating and, a, and an explanation of your motivation. But I, I noticed, Catherine, that once again in this book, you, you still find yourselves making the case <laughs> for diversity and inclusion. You know, why is that after the, the huge investment that, that Sue's been describing? Why, why are we still having to make the case, let alone make progress? I think it's because it feels like it's something happening somewhere else. You know, it, it's someone else's job. And surely if it's that much of an issue, wouldn't we have a you know, it would have happened by now, wouldn't it? Or, or that uh, people feel that if they're not in a protected characteristic, maybe they shouldn't say anything because it's it's not their job. And and it's it's a very you know you go to different. I mean, I think we've told you this story before, Jan. But we went to one place and mm -hmm. uh, they had a they had a, a DNI budget, but they made all the people compete for the budget like some kind of hideous version of Hunger Games, you know, so one year <laughs> neurodiversity and the next year it was it, it was uh, disabled. And I think the reason why we have to do it is because the statistics just aren't getting through. It, mm. I, I think we have to turn it into a, into a genuine people issue where people feel invested in it rather than all of the Boston consulting groups about uh, and, and the McKinsey's turn around saying the proof is here. It doesn't feel, I think for some people it doesn't feel tangible Mm -hmm. Or it feels like, oh, if we sort the pipeline out, it'll be fine. Forgetting that it's kind of like it's recruitment and it's retention and then it's promotion, mm -hmm. not just that whole chat about, oh, well, or, or even just tick boxing. You know, we've come across a bit of tick boxing as well, which is, oh, well, you know, we've got somebody slightly different. That's fine. We've done it. Mm -hmm. I think the other issue as well is that to some people it feels an intractable issue. I mean, one mm -hmm. of the chaps that I interviewed for the book came up to me after we published The Glass Wall and said, look, um, at a conference said, I'm white, I'm middle-aged, I'm very privileged. I think I don't know how to help mm. because what if I get it wrong? Mm. What, if I, what if I say the wrong thing or what if I, what if I make it worse mm. by doing something that's the wrong thing? Mm. It's, yeah. It's interesting you describe this notion of almost competing protected characteristics and, and, a, and a hierarchy of importance uh, as opposed to the whole essence of your notion of belonging, which is actually this is, this is going to benefit everyone. Um, of course, when you, when you published the book, it was, a, it was just after the summer and the terrible murder of George Floyd and the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement. So there, there was a kind of feeling of one aspect of diversity coming to the, the fore at that time, which you can't, couldn't possibly have known when you, when you set off writing it. I'm, in, I'm interested, um, Sue, in, in 
what impact that had as you published the book on its reception and the kind of conversations that you've, you've been having? I mean, are people more open to the idea that this is more than gender and, um, you know, a, a really big issue where the time has come and, and we must make progress? I think that I think that the events of the summer, the, the killing, murder of George Floyd, absolutely focused everyone in business in the UK and, and, and the US and, and many countries around the world, although not every country around the world, but many countries around the world in terms of the importance of this and the unjustness of mm. the current situation. However, I, we, do, we do feel strongly that the issue is about breaking the current mold of business which has mm -hmm. been designed, as we said in the glass wall, actually, but, you know, uh, this is still obviously true, that the current mould of business was built, not even in the 20th century, but in the 19th century, for a small number of uh, white patriarchal men, workaholic men with stay-at-home full-time partners, to mm. succeed at. Like that, that, that's, that's how work was designed. The other event, obviously, of, of the summer and, and the last few months has been more remote working, yeah. working from home. It's been enforced on us by the lockdown, but it's really shown, you know, you know, in, in certainly at Mediacom, it was overnight one day in March that we can all operate really well from remote, remote working. And although it came about out of being forced to do so, it's transformed how we work. And the big questions moving forward is how we really get rid of these sacred cows, mm. these, these ways of operating that don't suit all kinds of talented people, many of whom um, fall into black, Asian, minority, ethnic, mixed race groups, many of whom fall into other protected characteristics, neurodiverse, disabled, there, are, there, there is the issue of women with, with dependents at home, whether those are children or, or um, you know, aged relatives or, or somebody with a disability. You do not destroy efficiency and creativity by allowing a more flexible and um, creative approach to how people work. You mm. encourage it, mm. you improve it. And so, yes, I think all kinds of things, that, all kinds of the events of last year have step changed this conversation. It is now totally our job as leaders in our industry to make sure that we reimagine the workplace going back and don't just go, oh, thank goodness that was all over. Let's go back to how things were. Yes, exactly. You, you, you have um, one concept, uh, Catherine, in your slipper, which I thought was rather deliciously named, the glass, syn the glass slipper syndrome. Uh, as someone who was watching Cinderella just yesterday on the television, uh, I, won I wonder if you could explain what that is and, and how we address it. Uh, well, the Disney Cinderella is a, is a much nicer version than the original Cinderella, um, as most Disney things are, brushing aside so many unpleasantnesses. Um, so uh, the glass slipper syndrome is actually, if you go back to the original story, they're quite grim, those, those, those original fairy tales. It's, yeah. it's like when you read them, I don't think I'd read them to a child now. We'd probably get reported for kind of child <laughs> cruelty. But what one, the stepsisters actually cut off their toes to fit into the slipper. And then the only thing that gave them away was the fact there was so much blood in their oh, shoes. Yeah. Um, which is interesting. And it's, it's true of so many of us when we go to work. It's what we do is we turn up and... Uh, people say, oh, we've got a really great culture. And you turn up and there's this notion of culture fit. And actually quite a lot of culture fit is, is you have to fit in, you can't be yourself. Mm. You know, so if you, uh, we talked about this, Sue and I've talked about this at length, but it's very interesting. You know, you probably have two or three interviews for any company, spend about three hours with those people. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you turn up and you're spending five hours a day with them in an office. You suddenly turn up and go, I mean, I know almost certainly, I know friends who've turned up and gone, oh, my God, I've just got to get out of here. It's like some kind of cult. It's just weird. You have to be a certain way. Um, and I've just finished reading a book called Uncanny Valley, which is about 
uh, San Francisco and startups. And that's true as well about how that works for certain people. And what glass slipper syndrome is, is you turn up and you go, oh, I, I can't be this type of person. I have to be this. And this isn't who you really are. And you spend, I think there's some statistic that, you know, you spend a huge amount of your time pretending to be something that you're not rather than doing your work. Mm, and so mm. that glass slipper syndrome where you think, I can't be me. I've got to be, I've got to, I've got to chop my toes off and fit in. And it doesn't matter how much you're bleeding, as long as no one notices, it's fine. Mm. And what you, sh you know, so much of organisations, if what we said is, we don't want you to be a culture fit, we want you to be a culture expander. So yes. If you, are, if you are different, if you've got a different way of thinking, that's absolutely brilliant because it changes the dynamic and it enables other people to feel free. Yes. Well, of course, this is something I relate to very much, Catherine. I mean, when I went to Aviva, um, I'd come out as a gay woman, then went back in the closet. And I actually had that extraordinary experience of how bent out of shape you get, and how exhausting mm -hmm. it is, hiding who you are which for me was, you know, not being able to mention my girlfriend, the real things I was doing in the evenings and the weekends. And it, it was astonishing um, how incredibly tiring it was mentally navigating and trying to remember what I'd said to, to who. And I know that can happen to people in all sorts of ways. But, but, but Sue, we're here. We're speaking to uh, the MRS and of course we're very interested in research and, and measurement and I suppose I, I have to to ask you what your thoughts are on how on earth you go about measuring whether you have a culture in which people feel they belong. So we asked the question do you feel as though you belong at work and the, a, a business called uh, Dynata very kindly conducted the research for us in the UK and the US so I think it's highly measurable. Now, you do need to have a measure of what your diversity is as well, because clearly if you are a small business and everybody is a rugby-loving you know, northerner, then every time another rugby-playing northerner joins, he feels like he's going to belong. So you have to have a, a diversity measure and then a belonging measure. But I think simply asking the question, what we found, which we were quite shocked about is that one in three people in the UK don't feel as though don't don't agree that they feel like they belong in their organization which means that if this was the three of us in a meeting and I feel like I belong then one of the two of you feels that like like they don't so that feels like much too high um, a statistic and we also went on to ask other questions as well so the one statistic, again, that really shocked me was people who've actually experienced diversity, equality, inequality or inappropriate behaviour at work. Mm -hmm. And again, it's one in three people have experienced this, some kind of harassment. But in underrepresented groups, so groups that are underrepresented in senior management, these figures just are much, much higher. So mixed race was something like 60 percent, disabled people 59 percent. Um, under 25s who again do seem to have a different view of what the workplace should be like, you know, over a, about a third of, of those people. And just as so many people have witnessed, have experienced it, even more of us have witnessed it. And um, this feels to me, I don't know what you think, Jan, this feels to me that something that we can all make a change on, we can, we can all make a difference. If we actively champion that difference, if we actively speak up for each other, if we don't simply try and smooth things over so that things don't get challenged, then we can change our industry. It's in yes, our I, I, I do agree with you. Of course, pe people can find it difficult to, to speak up and not want to be the troublemaker, uh, not want to out themselves in, in many ways. Uh, and I was very interested when um, we were looking at this at Aviva, one of the ways in which we measured whether uh, leaders and managers were being inclusive and helping to create a sense of belonging was we, we would ask their team whether they felt listened to um, because actually active listening you know, there's no point having diversity in your team if you don't hear from them and, and very often it's the extroverts or the most confident who are always contributing to meetings so it's not always about your identity per se that that where well, of course you might feel microaggressions but it, it's actually a sense of not being involved in the conversation 
um, and how do you measure that? Yeah. I agree. One of the things we say in the book is that the joiners in are not the problem. Yeah. You know, anyone can have anyone can have a great culture from the people who join in because they'll join in on the thing. It's it's those people who don't join in but have, may have masses to contribute in terms of different thinking. You know, taking the Matthew side, rebel ideas. Um, you know, thought that you need misfits to create new answers to things so that you can actually get competitive advantage because it's from making everyone that's diverse in terms of thought or behavior or being belong you get those ideas gelling and it's one of the things Catherine that we've talked about a lot isn't it is is how you make sure that you get everybody to join in with things not just the people who are the joiners in so I think you're absolutely right Yes, I also hated being asked to speak for the whole gay community as well. That's another pressure. You know, I simply want to contribute as Jan, and obviously yeah. my lived experience is part of that. But but I think we can be quite clumsy in in our in our efforts to measure diversity, and we do that through protected characteristics very often. We can be a little bit clunky as well about um, you know. So so tell us, Jan, what will lesbians think of this idea? Is it, it's, it's not it the greatest is, way no. of being involved in a conversation. It's, so it's, it's a phenomenon, <laughs> diversity fatigue, which, which is applies to people for whom these initiatives are for because they're just sick and tired of being invited on stage and asked to speak yes. to their entire community where yes. they can barely, you know, there are days, you know, one can barely decide what to have for lunch, let alone yes. speaking, representing some sort of community. And also there's the intersectionality point as well, which is that it is... You know, most of us fall into more than one type of person as well. You know, I can speak for short people and introverts on one day. <laughs> <laughs> Gender and you know, race another day. It's a, and, and and the other thing is is that there's all sorts of hidden characteristics as well. So particularly with things like you know mental health and and also supporting family members, um, you don't get to see by looking at the immediate. Kind of person in front of you what those characteristics are and and there's quite a lot of pain caused when people get judged for how they appear and they feel as though they are not being heard so i do know yeah. that there's a number of those straight white middle class men who feel as though they are constantly being told off mm. for who they are and that uh, we do know from um deloitte research that 40 percent of that group feel as though they have to cover all the time at work. Yes, so protect yes. them when they're not. Yes, exactly. I think that's been one perhaps one of the unintended consequences of the focus on gender so much, as opposed to everything and all of us and the whole of us, that it's it's made men feel on the back foot, hence what you were saying at the beginning. Now now Catherine, I know you're um leading the charge on this all in census for the industry tell, tell us a bit about that hopefully people watching this completed <laughs> on time but i should hope so well um actually all, all in came from uh the idea that the ipa has been doing research for a long time about the makeup of agencies i work at amidra and i've never been asked to do anything like that and every company asks it in different ways and so we gathered kind of what there was and of course we went to the font of all wisdom which is lovely jane frost and said to her this is what we want to do you are you know you you know tell us tell us what to do and tell us what to ask because what we want to do is make this an effective survey across agencies brands and media owners um to measure what the diversity of the advertising and communications industry is it's never been done before we don't think there's ever been a a sector-wide yeah. uh, piece of work like this um so it is a bit scary uh in terms of it and th but then what we'll do is we will actually know um where we are and uh it's uh anonymous so one of the things we think that we will get is data that maybe perhaps people wouldn't share with their employers it's been one of the questions that's come back to us the most is this will be completely anonymized won't it and because i might be more honest in this than i will be if it's something held internally which i thought was quite interesting um so we're asking people to uh fill in the form on the uh 10th of march and for a few days afterwards as well we're asking people to be all in because if we know where we are as an industry 
we can make you know measure what our progress is rather than just guess um you know and you treasure what you measure uh and then there's a few other things going alongside it. Sue's got another work stream as well that she's working on, which is about representation uh, in front of the camera and behind the camera. That's kind of chugging along at a rate as well, because it's not enough for us to put people in front of the camera, you know, in a in a in casting, and then the people who are behind the camera are the same old, same old, you know. And we're not actually pushing we're not representing the serve, the communities that we serve. So all in is the start point. We'll do it every two years um, and we'll see how we how we do. But it's, it's, it's obviously great timing because the, the national census is going on at the moment. So it must be on on people's minds. But I, I, I do know. It's almost as if we to a really great organisation, you know, sorting out market research when we chose our date. <laughs> I know, I know. But as you say, people can be very uh, reluctant to take part in these kinds of of, of questionnaires. So how, how are you encouraging people to trust that this, um, you know, really will be a useful exercise? Because I know people can be made to feel very vulnerable by sharing, for instance, mental health issues that they may have or other disabilities, never mind um, other aspects of their identity. Well, everything is held with the research company. So everything is held with Kantar. It's not, um, and everything is kind of aggregated. And I think that what we're saying to people is, it, it's a bit like the message of belonging, actually. You can lead from every seat. And unless we hear from people, we can't change our industry. And uh, and and you are part of a, a bigger movement to change the way that our industry is, rather than just something maybe in a culture that you feel that you don't belong, but you can have your voice heard elsewhere. Yes, and exactly. So far, so far, you know, holding groups are really, really good in the in uh, ad agencies. You've got lots of big media owners who've signed up. So Facebook have signed up, News International have signed up. You know, we've got a lot of momentum behind it. Um, and I am hopeful that, you know, it will it will drive change. It will enable us to make a measurement for change. Well, good. Well, I'm glad we can reinforce it here because this, this audience will need no persuading on the importance of, of you know, good data and good insight on, on this topic. Yeah. So, 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 Sue, you're you're obviously the leader, uh, chief transformation officer of a big old organisation, and I think just bringing it down into the practicalities of what what you yourself are grappling with at the moment, it would just be great to have a little bit of insight on. Mediacom, your day job, as it were, and what what kind of crosses your desk on this topic at the moment? Because I know everybody feels they're on a journey, and even with someone as both articulate and knowledgeable as you, I, no doubt there are issues you're having to to face. And it, it'd just be really great to get a little window into what you're grappling with. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody's on a journey. Nobody's perfect, and that needs to be really clear which is that you, there, there is also no hope in perfection. You can, you, you can, all you can do is try and get better and be good enough. Um, there's a number of um, initiatives that Mediacom has applying both in the UK and is also, are also rolling out worldwide. So I'm a member of the Mediacom Global Belonging Council, which is dedicated to sharing best practices around the world and also being on a journey. We've got six key areas that we are going to be making change in um, across the global network. As Mediacom UK, my CEO, Kate Rowlinson, last year introduced compulsory microaggression and allyship training for everybody, which was absolutely brilliant, and a, a really excellent and, and eye-opening, and, and again, a, a start. Um, and then what we do have as well is we have uh, targets for diversity at every single level, and that's both in terms of types of people um, in terms of protected characteristics, but also in terms of whole brain thinking. So making sure that we've got a, a really good diverse mix of different kinds of thinking in order to improve the quality of the work that we serve our clients with. Um, and I think one of the things that's really important is that we share best practice. Um, so we do have um, uh, an event coming up actually later, um, uh, or actually, this month where what we're doing is we're sharing our best practice with the industry so that we can get this conversation going. Cause this isn't something where 
It's about having a competitive advantage. It's about making our industry better for everybody. Yes, exactly. Well, we're coming towards the, the end now. And I'd sort of like to finish where we began, began in as much as the insight that men were not in the room, which led you to, to write this book together again called called belonging and I'm going to hold it up again and, and hope that, that, uh, that people do get hold of it because it's wonderfully practical in its advice. I mean if you were just going to leave us with one thought from everything you've learned so far about people listening to this who want who want to get their men more involved what would your advice be? Look, for me it would be never ever be a, be a, be a passive bystander again always find a way of saying something that might be in the moment it might be after the moment but i think if every single one of us pledged that we would always say something and always do something when those situations arrive where we know things have been said that have made people feel uncomfortable or that are not right then i think we have a different industry so it's the day in day out just pointing out when it's going wrong whatever the issue is that that's great advice bringing it to life in the the everyday catherine what about you i i think uh, building on sue's point i think it's the micro affirmations i think it you know if you are if you're finding someone doing you know if you do micro affirmation it doesn't always have to be you know i know, I know sometimes there's so much emphasis put around you know performance appraisals and what have you actually build that wall of micro affirmations and and making people feel that they belong we're not asking you to make a seismic change we're just asking mm -hmm. you to make a small changes every day that will build because i think that's the thing i think some men think oh my god i'm gonna have to rebuild myself as a person no you don't you just have to kind of think in a way that makes your colleagues feel that they belong that's a that's wonderful. I've not heard that that word before. Micro affirmation as the antidote to, to micro aggregation. Ag aggression. Sorry, can't even speak now. Um, <laughs> I just want to finish by by thanking you both so much. Um, I wish we'd had more time on this because I think it's a subject close to all three of our hearts that we could speak about for hours. Um, but I would just like to finish by encouraging everyone to read the whole of the book i hope today's given you a, an appetite for it and to thank you sue and catherine and your silent partner mark uh, for bringing this to us and uh, good luck with everybody i hope you will find some little nugget just to try because uh, as we say it's what you can do progressively that's an improvement every day and everybody doing it that will actually get us there in the end thank you so much both of you Thank you. Jen. Thank you.